Hey, everybody. Welcome to the World of Wonders podcast. I'm Ryan. I'm Amanda, and we're your hosts. And before we introduce you guys to our tremendous guest for today, we just want to take a moment to say thank you to all the people who have been sending us messages and sending us emails. Um, it's been really cool to see lots of people saying they feel inspired listening to the podcast or they've decided to leave their job and go on a big backpacking trip. That's been really fun to see those coming in. Yeah, definitely. Thanks to everyone who's reached out or, you know, commented on Facebook and who's really becoming a part of our community. It's really cool to meet you guys and hear from you. So if there's anyone who's been holding back a question, definitely don't just shoot us an email or send us a message. We really do love to hear from everyone out there. Yeah. So let's get to our guest. So today on the podcast, we have Ash Emberger of the Middle Finger Project. And this is super, super, super cool for us. Uh, We've both read her book, You Don't Need a Job, You Need Guts. And it's just a spectacular, spectacular book. I really can't say enough great things about it. I feel like it's just a book that really spoke to me and has really inspired me to pursue the entrepreneurial things that I want in my life. And so to have Ash on the podcast to talk to all of you out there is pretty amazing. And we'll get into Ash's story as we go through the interview, but she came out of college, had had a bit of travel experience, was working kind of the the corporate life, doing well, and just feeling that sense of um, the meaningless, not maybe not meaninglessness, but dissatisfaction that I think so much, so many of us can relate to, um, people who have been traveling or done something really exciting and enriching and then go back to work and you're really like, "Eh, is this really all that there is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And she, she shares sort of her story with that, with us and then with you guys as well. And it's pretty cool because she's joining us from Costa Rica. So she's currently living abroad, Uh, which I think for a lot of people with the travel bug, that's kind of the dream out there. So she talks a little bit about that as well, which is very interesting. Yeah. And her story of building her business is really um, interconnected with travel. She left the U.S. to move down to Chile um, and was traveling and living in a new country while she built it up. Yeah, definitely. It's very cool. I think it's something that Ryan and I both were like, yes, this is exactly what we want to be doing. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And if you want to find out more about Ash, you can check out the middlefingerproject.org or follow her on Twitter at TMF Project. Without further ado, here's Ash. Uh, We got introduced to you. I'm currently doing program called Praxis and we do the You Need Guts course as like the start of our, um, the start of our little you did thing. is uh, it who's the professor um uh, tk coleman yes oh yeah. my gosh you are in that class get the hell out of here yeah so i was i was reading it and then really really liked it um and then when i got to the last chapter and read that i was like we need to talk to ash <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so delighted. I'm so glad. I can't believe you're in that class. He was tweeting me the other day and I was cracking up because um, that's the first time anyone has used that in the curriculum. (laughs) No, yeah, it's great though. It's like a a gold mine. Yeah. And it's, we're both from Canada, but Ryan's doing like his practice placement is down in Atlanta, Georgia. So that's where we are right now. And I got down to Atlanta a month after Ryan did. And he's like, you have to read this book. Like, it's so inspirational. It's so amazing. Like, it's going to just change your life. And he kind of like, just like sent it to me and kind of like poked at me for a while. Like, have you read it yet? Have you read it yet? And I was like, I'm getting to it, Ryan. And then I read it and I was like, damn, this is so good. Like, she's talking to me. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad. Sometimes I feel like, you know, I wrote that so long ago that sometimes I feel like I really need to revisit and, uh, you know, and, you know you, you, have you ever done that where you've written something, uh, you know, years ago and then you go back and you're kind of embarrassed because you're like, oh, I can totally write better than this now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can definitely I think, relate to yeah, that. Yeah. I think I need to do that with that book. But otherwise, I think the concepts are still legit, legit. So I'm glad. Awesome. I yeah. really don't know how that could be better, to be honest. <laughs> so. 
Um, and so we know that you're currently in Costa Rica, but we kind of want to back up and start from sort of the beginning of your traveling entrepreneurial career, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I'm, I'm totally game. Whatever you want to talk about, I am an open book. <laughs> okay. So where did you, where did you start? Well, you know what? It was funny because I grew up in this small town in the middle of nowhere where, you know, most people don't travel. They don't get on planes. I had never gotten on a plane before in my life. And, um, eventually I saved up enough money and I came here actually to Costa Rica for the very first time. First time I got on a plane, I remember my best friend drove me, you know, three hours to the airport. We cried. We hugged when she left. (laughs) (laughs) It was so dramatic and it was like my moment. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I love that. (laughs) It was totally my moment. I was like 19 years old or something. And, um, I remember my suitcase was overweight. That was the first thing. And then they're like, you know, they're telling me like, you well, you can take some stuff out of it. So there's me never having done this before. I'm completely mortified. I'm frantically throwing things out of my suitcase. Um, go to Costa Rica, realize that, holy shit, there's actually a whole other world out here. And how could I ever just stay in my little corner ever again? And so that's how that happened. I did go back to my little corner. You know, I finished university. I got my first job out of college. And I just remember sitting there looking out the window day after day. And I would see the planes. And I'd be like, man, I wonder where those guys are going. (laughs) (laughs) All the time. And I'd be making up stories. I'd be like, wow, they're probably going someplace exotic. I want to be doing that. Why am I sitting here? And that is exactly how I got my, my start. I decided to start my own business a few years after that. And I have been rocking it ever since for like a decade. That's amazing. Yes. And so when you were, you finished university, got, um, kind of your corporate job, was it in your mind at that point in time, like in the future, I want to be an entrepreneur, I want to be living abroad or were you kind of just going with it. And then while you were there, you were like, oh, this isn't really everything I thought it would be. Mm, no, I, I knew, you know what? I actually got, I I'm so grateful to have been given this opportunity when I was in high school. Um, you know, monster.com. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the founder of monster.com was actually from a small town in Pennsylvania, where I'm also from. And when he struck it big, he decided he wanted to give back. And he went on this hunt across the poorest counties in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and I think it was Virginia, and decided to offer a full scholarship to a really uh, great private institution. It was a couple you could pick from. Um, to anyone who he thought had the highest chance of success for becoming a future entrepreneur. And uh, so I competed in that, and I, I, I did all the interviews, and we, we went to Penn State University, which for me was, like, huge coming from my small little town. Yeah. And, um, and I won. And I won this amazing scholarship. So that was my first introduction to the world of entrepreneurship because he had made time to mentor us. And, you know, we'd have to go to these little camps and things like that. And ever since I saw him and ever since I saw him speak, I was like, gosh, you know, this feels good. This feels like power. Being able to do what you want feels like power. That's cool. I like it. So I guess it started early, but I didn't really have, you know, any idea what I was going to do. And I was kind of still on the the traditional career path for quite some time. Yeah. That's pretty amazing though, that somebody took the money that they had earned and put it towards like other people. Yeah. Like going to university. Did it pay for your tuition? Is that what it did? It did. It was, I, you know, I went to a private school called Wilkes University in Pennsylvania, which was about $40,000 a year. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it paid for all of that. It also paid for my semester abroad the first time I went to Costa Rica. 
Um, which, you know, it's funny. I had to make the case for it. I remember running the numbers and being like, guys, this is way cheaper for me to go to Costa Rica for this semester than it is for me to stay at Wilkes. Um, can the, the scholarship transfer? And he allowed it, which was awesome. So I, I would have never had the money. I grew up in a really uh, humble, humble household. So I would have never had the money to do that if it weren't for him. But he was amazing. He gave us a free laptop, a brand new Dell, my first laptop ever. Um, and in exchange, all we had to do was, I think it was 20 hours of community service every month um, in the summertime. That was it. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. That's really cool. And yeah. when you So when you left your job to um, start your own thing, were you... Were you planning on staying in the States or was it always in your mind to go abroad to start doing that? Oh, it was always in my mind to go abroad. Always. It was, um, I mean, so back before I knew that I was going to start this company, I would be, I mean, just crawling all over the travel websites. I used to go to this website. I don't even know if it's still in existence. It was called Escape Artist. Has anyone heard of that? I I haven't heard of it. I haven't either, but we'll have to look it up. (laughs) Okay, so it's like totally from the early 2000s, I'm sure. (laughs) But at the time, it was like the creme de la creme of travel sites. And I was just so amazed because it was all about the expat life and and all of these different e-books, which at the time, e-books were a huge new thing. Um, And I would sit there and I would would really just, I, I explored every career option possible that could potentially put me on a plane again. I thought about becoming... Um, a flight attendant. I, th- <laughs> <laughs> I, I I've also of- debated that. <laughs> it's like, maybe yeah. I should just become a flight attendant. Like then I can keep traveling. <laughs> yep. Yep. I did that. And then I remember thinking like, well, actually maybe I could make more money if I just became the pilot. Like maybe I'll just fly planes. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started taking, I swear to God, I actually started taking private flying lessons for my private pilot's license back then. Wow, that's cool. That's great. (laughs) Did you finish? Oh, God, no. (laughs) No, I remember walking in there. I remember, well, when when I was getting dressed for my very first lesson, I remember thinking to myself, like, what kind of shoes do you wear to fly a plane? <laughs> like, it's like a know, legitimate question. What did, what did you settle on? And so I settled on red cowboy boots. <laughs> <laughs> That's clearly the obvious choice. <laughs> Uh, clearly. And then I remember the the look on this instructor's face. He's like a retired pilot or something. And he just took one look at me like, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a short-lived career in the sky. But, um, That's yeah. okay. You tried it out. You know it's not for you. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I was really interested in doing whatever I could to create some kind of a lifestyle abroad. I actually kept going. I went and got my master's degree in linguistics um, and I got a certificate for teaching English as a second language because of course, I'm like, there's a backup. I can always do that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Gosh, yeah. I I had all these different ideas because I was just so desperate. I remember, oh, I remember applying to work in marketing at different universities all around the world. I was just so into it. So since day one, but what I ended up doing was so much better. Running my own business from the internet is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's probably a better option than being a flight attendant or a pilot. (laughs) Yeah. Well, now now when I fly, I see the flight attendants going up and down. I'm like, my ass would not even fit in this aisle right now. What? I could have never done this. They just keep making like aisles and seats smaller and smaller and smaller too. I actually just flew back from Canada on Wednesday and I was like, I'm not like, I'm the pretty average size girl. And I was like, these seats are tight for me. Like I'm five <laughs> seven and this is like really small. Yeah. Yeah. And can we talk about the proper etiquette? I need to ask somebody this. Maybe you guys are the perfect people. Can we talk about the proper airplane etiquette for when you are coming back from the bathroom and all of a sudden the flight attendants have like the cart of stuff? What's the etiquette there? Because you always end up standing there looking like a total asshole 
You know, like you, you don't know if you're supposed to try to get around them, if you're just supposed to wait, if you're supposed to wait by the bathroom. Like, what do you do there? <laughs> so anytime that's ever happened to me, they've like quickly just like noticed me and then moved their moved the cart back enough. But I've never been in a situation where like the two carts would make it impossible for that to happen. Yeah, I think you've got to wait if they're like too far in it and you're like too far up. I think you have to wait it out. But I don't know. I feel like it should be the paying customer (laughs) is the one with the priority, but I don't know. (laughs) I just never know what to do there because I'm like, you know, you're standing in front of the plane and you're trying so hard not to make eye contact with like the hundred people in front of you, but you don't really know like where else to look, right? (laughs) Like like looking at the ceiling. (laughs) Yeah. You're like standing there awkwardly and then plane hits some turbulence and you almost fall over (laughs) because you're not used to that. (laughs) Whack somebody in the head. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. I mean, such a, these are first world problems, I think, but you know. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. And then, so when you first started the Middle Finger Project, you, you were in, or you had went down to Chile, right? Yes and no. Um, I, so I started my first copywriting business much sooner than the middle finger project in 2000 and I want to say eight or seven. Oh God, I'm getting old. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And it totally flopped. It was a complete shit show. I did not know anything about business and I, I did a really horrible job there. So I rejoined corporate America doing advertising sales for many years no, not many years, a couple years, because I started the Middle Finger Project right at the end of 2009, uh, and not really as a business. It just started as a blog, and it was just a way for me to talk about. I think what a lot of the a lot of the reader or the listeners here probably are interested in is this idea of okay, so I want to do something amazing with my life. I want some freedom. I want some flexibility. But how? And where do you, you know, where do you go from here? And what do you do? So it was really just an open table kind of a discussion platform at that point. And I started growing subscribers and it was crazy. Um, and then it was later that I realized that I had a whole audience of people that wanted to give me money. Mm-hmm. So that's how it started. Yeah. 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 I was listening to your interview with TK and I thought it was really interesting how you were talking about you like pre-sold your book because you had this audience just to see if they would buy it? I did. I did. And that's actually something that I'm writing about right now in my current um, memoir that I'm working with an agent in New York to actually publish. So that's really exciting. And that was exactly what I did. I said to myself, look, you know, I might not have... um, a huge savings account. And I might not have a lot of, of money to go traveling. I might not have a lot of anything right now, totally tanked my business. Like, what am I going to do next? But I did have 3,500 subscribers or something like that. Mm -hmm. And the thought occurred to me because I really wanted to start writing again. I really wanted to start up my, my business again, but I was scared to death because I had so royally screwed it up the first time. And I think that was my way of, of dipping my toe in the water in a really creative way and saying, guys, I'm going to write this. I want to write this, but, um, I don't know. Do you, do you want to buy it? (laughs) (laughs) So so when you, when you put it out there, what was kind of the vision for what was going to happen? Like before anyone had pre-bought it, did you have uh, an expectation Oh God, no, I really, I had never sold anything on my blog before. I had no clue what to expect. I was scared to death that I was going to be laughed out of the, out of town. Um, it was really unconventional what I was doing at the time, right? It's like, Hey, I'm setting up an e-commerce site here. I'm setting up a buy button. I forget how much it was. I think it was something like $8. I mean, it was like something so small, $8 or 12 And, you know, I was essentially, I wrote a sales page and I said, look, this is what I'm doing. This is when the book is coming out. If you want to buy it now, you can have it for this price. Um, Support me. Like, let's go. Let's do this thing. 
And my audience at the time, I had a really great audience because everyone was so engaged and we really talked a lot on social media and places like that. So I had a really great head start. And when I came out of that sale, now I can't remember verbatim right now. I have to actually look at this number, but I think when I came out of that sale, I might have had almost $5,000, um, which for me was huge. That was my, I mean, that was huge at the time, humongous. Yeah. It's, um, yeah. I mean, that's a good amount of money to just, <laughs> to have from people being like, yeah, we're interested in what you have to say. Like, that's pretty sweet. Yeah. And it's funny. I mean, as you keep going and as I've been so humbled to grow, uh, if I launched something right now and only made $5,000, I would literally commit suicide. I would just jump right off the cliff. Like what has happened? <laughs> Clearly <Please> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how perspective changes, but yes, at the time $5,000 was huge. It made the, all the difference for me. It gave me enough confidence and courage to really take myself seriously. I wrote that book. I continued to sell that book. I had it professionally designed by my girlfriend who was a designer. Thank God. Um, and then I kept writing and I took on my first clients and I kept building the business that way. It was a really unconventional way to do it, but it worked. And you did all this from Santiago. Is that right? Or most of it? Oh, <clears throat> right. So I did... I did leave for Santiago shortly after that launch, right? So I had that $5,000. I needed to get out of Philadelphia, and that's exactly where I went. I had done some volunteer work in Santiago previously when I was doing my, my graduate work. So I had some contacts there, and the cost of living was really inexpensive. I know you guys have been there, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, 300 bucks a month for a high-rise, brand-new apartment, build- apartment in a building was fantastic, and... You know, it was like a weird conundrum at the time because in Philadelphia, um, I really needed a place to go. I needed an apartment. And every time you do that, it's like, okay, the bare minimum is $1,000. Plus, you have to have at least another $1,000 to put down for a deposit. You know, plus all of these other things like electricity and da 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 And it seemed like it was really expensive. And as someone who's bootstrapping my business, I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to make all that money? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. So I left for Santiago and it was the best decision I ever made. It gave me a lot of um, breathing room to be on my own and just focus on the business and, and grow like hell. And how long did you stay down in Santiago for? Um, I was there for several years, but it was that first year that I was there solid the whole year. And then I think I went might have gone back to the States for a couple of months because that first year I was able to make $103,000. So that was my, yeah, it was, um, it was a big leap from having $26 in my checking account before that, um, to all of a sudden with my own two hands being able to create something that supported me and let me do exactly what I wanted to do, which was, was travel. Do you remember at the time what it was like for your or the, like people in your social circle when you were trying to go off on your own, start something, moving down to South America, what were kind of your friends and other people in your network saying? They hated me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I joke about this all of the time because first when I started the middle finger project, I remember everyone thought it was such a joke. They, I mean, they wouldn't say it to my face, but you could tell in the tone of their voice. And I always say this because I remember I would see them at a happy hour or run into them at target and they would be like, so how's your blog? You know, like they were, <laughs> you know, like patting Seven me on the head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I was like, God, like, why is no one taking me seriously? I'm, I'm, I'm doing this thing. <laughs> um, and they did not. And then it started to take off. And then I remember I had one girlfriend even say to me, this was the like snarkiest comment anyone's ever said. She was like, you know, I just don't even get it. You're, you basically just say like common sense stuff on your blog. And like, you have all these people follow you. It just doesn't even like make sense. <laughs> And so I, I learned to quickly just like cut those guys out and I just, yeah, I just started traveling, but, um, 
it wasn't a supportive environment. I think people are very threatened in general when you start doing big things and especially things that maybe they're a little envious of in on the inside, but, uh, don't want to, you know, don't want to admit. Um, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I guess that probably is difficult for a lot of people who are going off just to travel. I'm sure they get a lot of pushback from family and friends talking about you should be stable. You should get a good job, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's something that we've talked about quite a bit on our podcast and with various guests that we've had on is sort of this, a lot of times networks will be supportive, but it's sort of this, like, I don't really know what you're doing, but you know, go do your thing type thing, like kind of smiling through their teeth. Yeah, that's the truth. Yeah. Do you think moving to a new city and being kind of out of the country made it a bit more comfortable taking what's kind of could be seen as like a risk business wise or career wise? Yeah. You know, I hadn't thought about it too much before you just said that, but you're right. If I had stayed in the United States and just started doing the middle finger project at some point, it, it may have, um, I don't know. It, I don't, I, you know, I don't know, but being in Santiago traveling, being, you know, I made some amazing friends there. You know how it is when you travel and you meet other travelers and somehow it's like the world's just come together and you're like, Oh my God, like you understand me. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's how it was. And I really, I had two of the the best girlfriends as a support system there. And we were all doing different things, but we, they were all slightly unconventional. And I think I really thrived from having that support. And I would not have found that if I had stayed in Philadelphia. That is for damn sure. Yeah. And when you're, I think when you're going somewhere new, it kind of allows you to kind of change, like obviously change who you are in a way, because instead of something new being a change that everyone who knows you is kind of like, Oh, that's weird. Like this person I know who I used to think of as X is now turning into Y you can just show up and be like, Oh, Hey, I'm Ash. I'm I run a business online and everyone's like, Oh, cool. Like that's who you are. Yeah, that's true. I think, you know, I, for me, when I travel and I still to this day, I love the rush the creative rush that I get from being in a new context, you know, it used to just be really exciting for me from a personal standpoint, but now from a professional standpoint, it is one of the best things I can ever do for my writing. Um, every time I go somewhere new, it just, it's this collision of being forced to pay attention that I think heightens your senses so much. And for me as a writer, it just does wonders. Highly recommend it. (laughs) Yeah, I can definitely see that. Like you just start noticing everything around you so much more instead of doing the same commute or the same walk every day and you kind of just things become normal. Yeah, I did a lot of research on this at one point and actually wrote about this um, in a different book at once where, you know, I I was studying really what creativity is. And it's fascinating because legitimately creativity is when, you know, you've got this new input coming into your brain, a new idea, and all of a sudden it collides with an old idea that you had in your brain and it, you know, forms together a a brand new one. And that's how creativity is formed. So if you don't have that new input, if you are just seeing your same surroundings every single day. Um, sometimes the rut that you feel like you're in, you actually are, your brain really can't produce new ideas because there's no new input. So fascinating and great for travel. Great. Um, just, you know, (laughs) advertisement for travel. Yeah, definitely. That's really interesting because I feel like it's something that I've experienced personally, but to actually hear that that's sort of a scientific thing is really cool to hear. (laughs) I know. I know. I'm just put on my scientist hat. (laughs) (laughs) So so how did you end up making the transition to living in Costa Rica full time? Uh, You know, uh, okay. Gosh, my fiance is going to kill me. (laughs) I, (laughs) if I could have my choice, I would not be living in Costa Rica. Um, but I am here because I, I totally fell madly crazily in love so, um, I used to go back and forth between South America and Europe or wherever I was going. And sometimes I would stop in Costa Rica because of that original semester I spent here when I was a college kid. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and I would just, you know, stop, hang out for a week, say hello. And when I did that about 40 years ago, I bumped into this guy that I, I knew and we hit it off and I don't know what happened, <laughs> but, um, we kept talking and I had left, I kept traveling, but for the next four months we talked on FaceTime every single day, like crazy people. And, um, and then I came back. And so now I'm here. We try to travel quite a bit. We're off to some other countries coming up here soon. And, you know, spending some time in the U.S. here and there. But I do spend the large part of my year here in Costa Rica on the mountain. <laughs> With the iffy Wi-Fi. What's, yeah. What's the, the iffy Wi-Fi. What are some of the day-to-day challenges of running a business while being in Costa Rica or another country that's kind of not as like developed as the U S for example. Um, you definitely start to feel like an invalid. I mean, here I am like spending a large part of my day inside, uh, by myself. And of course you have things like Twitter and the internet, which is great. But I miss that very much from the office setting. That's one of my biggest things. And even living in the States, you know, you do get that sense of social, even if you're just walking around going to coffee shops. Um, but here, the living environment for, for me is just different. Um, if I go and work in a coffee shop, either I'm going to be sweating all day. <laughs> um, I can't, you know, do stuff like this. I can't actually do interviews or do videos or do whatever it, I, it is I have to do. Um, chances are great. The Wi-Fi won't work <laughs> very great. So that has been one of my biggest challenges is if I have to get work done for real, I pretty much need to stay at home and be by myself. And you you know, you get, you get antsy and I do travel a lot just to random places to home or whatever, just so I can drive around in a car. I rent cars. I just drive around in them and I, I do all the normal things that people do, like go to Target. <laughs> <laughs> Shopping yeah, I would say, target. <laughs> yeah, all the time. I would say that's my biggest thing. Um, my second biggest thing definitely is is the lack of of access to modern anything, which would be great. I mean, I have to send. The other day, I was ordering camera equipment, but I, you know, to send it from Amazon, I have to like wait weeks for it to get here. <laughs> And it's so, not just like the, the 24 hour to 48 hour turnaround <laughs> and it's delivered at your doorstep. Yeah. I miss that a lot. I mean, you have no idea how much money I've saved because that doesn't exist here. It's like, I really have to wait for my purchases. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, you usually have to pay a pretty, a pretty hefty tax. Some of the things are taxed at 80% when you do bring them in. So, um, that's, you know, that's not fun. I don't have normal things here like cars for that same exact reason. I don't have credit here. So I can't just walk in and buy myself a cool car because I would have to pay for it in cash. And since cars are double the price, if I just want a regular car, half the time, they're a hundred thousand dollars. So it's like, you know, I'm not paying a hundred thousand dollars for a Hyundai. Yikes. <laughs> that's expensive. <laughs> that's absurd. Yeah. So those are the things, I guess, as I'm settling into this life in one place that I'm finding very frustrating. Uh, you know, it's, it's different when you're traveling all over all the time because you don't have needs for those things. But here being in one place, I'm noticing like, okay, I could really use life to be like a little bit easier than yeah. it is. <laughs> Do you kind of like thrive off the challenges of those small day-to-day things or is it kind of just like, eh, I'm over it? <laughs> No, no, I want to kill myself. Totally. Like, <laughs> no, like my armpits get all sweaty and I just get like red face and I'm like, the electricity is out again. <laughs> yeah. One of the I'm things I love ab- about traveling. Um, so for example, like when we went to Southeast Asia and you get all these like kind of random experiences like crossing the street or like going to buy something in a new section of the city um or like you know coordinating something where you're buying something um it's like so much more of a challenge so it's so much more rewarding you're like yeah we crossed the street that's awesome we didn't die <laughs> um, but yeah i could see after a while it's like fun for like three weeks when you come back and you're like wow i'm really a winner because like i'm doing all these things um <laughs> but after a while you just be like okay i can't deal with this anymore 
true. I used to feel so proud of myself when I just did things like, I don't know, like went to the mayor's office and actually, I don't know, like paid a parking ticket here. I mean, in Spanish, like the little things like, oh, um, or, or riding the bus. I'm like, look, I fit in. I rode the bus. Yeah. Yeah, we've had one of the, we that did that in Bangkok, rode the city bus, and we're like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, we're, we're like winners. locals, yes. <laughs> exactly. Like the little things. You're like, see, I know the word for that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. When, when we were in Spain before we'd really like studied any Spanish, just like getting a meal that was enjoyable, like the thing that I wanted was such a win for me. Like, getting chicken i'd be like yes i got the chicken like i ordered <laughs> the thing i wanted like it's so great day made <laughs> oh my god we were recently in guatemala and we were cracking up at this restaurant because i hate fish i don't eat fish i won't eat fi- i think they're disgusting <laughs> <I just don't laughs> fish. and so we had gone back and forth with this waiter and now mind you my fiance speaks spanish he's costa rican and we go back and forth with this waiter about, you know, the, whatever dish I was ordering, which sounded delicious. And then it, it arrived and it was totally fish. I took one bite. I'm like, this is totally fish. <laughs> <laughs> so we were just cracking up because the fish follow me. Like they like to haunt me. <laughs> <laughs> Wake up in the middle of the night and there's something. <laughs> there's like a wet fish like slapping me across the face. <laughs> oh my gosh, you. <laughs> I like fish and that grosses me out. (laughs) Um, Yeah, it's funny. (laughs) Do you think that learning and... Are you fluent in Spanish, would you say? Um, You know, yeah, I think I'm all right. I I have an undergrad degree in Spanish, so I was pretty hardcore about studying it when I was younger. When I was 19, I was like, boom, that's right. You thought I was Colombian, didn't you? (laughs) (laughs) And now I'm like, oh my god, what's the word for newspaper again? <laughs> mm-hmm. I was gonna, I was gonna ask it. if you felt like learning a second language um, improved your ability to write or what effect it had. But I guess if you were starting that early, it may not have may not have noticed it as much. You know, it's interesting. I was reading another study recently. <laughs> <laughs> as I put my, chin, my, my finger on my chin, um, <laughs> about legit, legit learning other languages really legitimately is now proven to, um, aid with, with Alzheimer's. So that's awesome. As far as my writing goes, you know, I actually think it screws it up. If I had to make any hypothesis about it, I actually think my brain gets jumbled sometimes especially listening to Carlos talk a lot, even in English, because he speaks English really well. But sometimes, you know, he just has the phrasing a little off. Mm-hmm. Um, like sweating my balls, he says. <laughs> 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 and he just doesn't say the off. Like, he just forgets that. Just or sweating like, my balls today. <laughs> yeah. Or like... Um, like, oh, aren't you going to clean up these scrums? <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> so weirdly enough, sometimes his little isms s- somehow transfer over to me, and I find myself saying phrases like the wrong way. And I'm like, wait, that's not how you say that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Ah. I like. I started a travel blog when we went down to South America, and I found that the longer I wrote for, like the more frequently I wrote for, the better my writing was getting. But then I was also learning Spanish and I felt like the more Spanish I learned, the worse my English writing got. (laughs) So it was like this trade-off where I was like, I feel like my writing's getting better and my Spanish is getting better, but now my writing's getting worse, but I'm doing it more. And it was this weird, because the more my brain would think in Spanish, the harder time I had creating (laughs) really beautiful English sentences. (laughs) I think they're correlated. (laughs) I was like, do I want to be like fluent in Spanish or do I want to write a really good travel blog? I don't know. (laughs) It's true. I remember one time trying to learn Italian while trying to learn Spanish and then also trying to learn French all like somehow all at the same time when I was younger. And I mean, my brain basically did explode. Like it just basically did. Yeah. That's a lot of languages on top of English. (laughs) We've had had, um, two kind of like 
polyglot language guys on the podcast who one of them i think was working on his seventh language and the other had new six and it was just like i don't understand how you could ever keep that together like how do you you compartmentalize it in your brain so that you understand them as like six separate entities right you know it's funny that was one of my big dreams that actually i need to get on this is ridiculous i have let myself down (laughs) i really wanted to keep going with the language learning but i really like i became pretty fluent in spanish and i was like okay done goal (laughs) achieved i can do it if i really want to bucket list list. (laughs) Good job, Ash. And then I just stopped. And I'm so mad at myself for that. I need to make some time. You need to move to, like, France or something like that. Oh, God. The French people hate me. I'm just such a loud, annoying American. (laughs) 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 Wearing red cowboy boots everywhere. (laughs) Still have the same pair. (laughs) I did wear those exact same red cowboy boots one time. Um, to a pub in London and I remember this guy looked at me I swear to God I had not opened my mouth I just arrived I didn't ask for anything yet and he looked me up and down with such disdain and was like you're American aren't you I'm just like God you sound so pained about it <laughs> is, there, but, <laughs> is there much of an expat community in the area you live in in Costa Rica yes but I don't like them would you care to expand on that (laughs) yeah it's a weird like i really don't belong in this country if you could have picked any country in the world to plot me in this would be the last country i would fit in at all because i'm not into yoga i'm not into hippie stuff i'm not into hemp tattoos i'm not into like natural herbs that get you high or whatever i'm not like into any of that stuff and that seems to be (laughs) the vibe here and so i don't even know what to do i can't even talk to people because we have this nothing in common i'm all like business publishing books i'm over here like making the money and they're like relax or something like chill out and check out the sunset and i'm like oh my god stop talking like that <laughs> <laughs> so that's my life in a nutshell so it's been like a bit hard to find like a group where you're like oh this is really like my my group of people Yes. I'm being such a negative Nancy, aren't I? And this is like the most negative podcast that you'd probably ever had. <laughs> no, not at all. It's been fun. It's been really fun. <laughs> I mean, straight up, it's the truth. I remember thinking like I would never experience any of that crap that you always learn about, like culture shock. Like I would, no, like I'm so flexible. I'm, I love travel. And now I don't know what stage I would call this, but it's like the grumpy old man stage <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> look i really don't care about you and your hippie braids just make my internet work <laughs> like bah! yeah i think it's cool too that i mean you could easily sit over there and be like yeah the beach is beautiful and like i don't really like surfing but i like watching the surfers and i think it's cool that you're just being real with you know what life is like down there because it's something that even with travel, like travel is amazing and there's so many great things about it, but it's not always pretty. Yes. Yes. I do think the one thing that I enjoy very much about this country is I I really do like getting out and hiking and walking and running. I think it's a great country for that. Um, to, you know, go exploring and be with nature. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, it's, it's just a different lifestyle and it is a very, there's a very distinct type of person that tends to come here. And it's usually either like young people or just kind of, you know, like th- that's cool. Like they're just having fun or it's really old, creepy, weird people who definitely have done something wrong in their life and they're escaping the law or <laughs> it's like the John McAfee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's like a child molester. Like you can tell they're just creepy. Mm. So, <laughs> so there's that. <laughs> That's not ideal. Are um, are your people who are working for the Middle Finger Project, are they all back in the States? Uh, yeah, we have contractors from all over the world. It's pretty cool, but the majority, yes, are in the United States of America. <laughs> Do you feel like you lose anything by having a business that's completely remote? Um, yeah. Or is it is it all upside? 
Now, I really do wish for an office. I really do wish for that. My developers right now are working with a really cool designer in San Diego, and they have this really great space there. And they're all getting together, and they're all like, you know, huddling about the middle finger project and slapping each other five. And then they're like Skyping me, and they're like, "Okay, Ash, well, we got, you know, we're gonna go get beers now. Like, see you later." And I'm all like, "Oh, but I, what about me?" <laughs> You're like, Skype me in. <laughs> Yeah, so that that really is it. But it's the same exact thing that I wanted to escape when I was younger and when I had all these big plans of traveling. It's the exact same thing I didn't want. Yeah. So it's funny how, you know, I think just as you get older, you start to want different things. I really think that's it. Because if I had the office, I probably wouldn't want that either. I don't know. Yeah, gra- yeah. grass is kind of always greener on the other side. Hey, it's like you want something one way and then you have it and you kind of want it differently. It seems like kind of an innately human thing. It's so true. I mean, I, you, it's true. If I had an office, I would be like, oh my gosh, I just want to fly to Guatemala. I just want to go and do this. I don't want anyone like watching me or feeling guilty when I'm not there. I, yeah. Yeah. Grass is always greener. Are there, are there other things like that where you, when you were in kind of the corporate job lifestyle, you were like, oh, this is going to be amazing when I don't have to do this anymore. And now you kind of find yourself wishing you could do that more. Is there anything else like that? Yes. The weirdest one ever. Are you ready for this? This is going to blow your mind. (laughs) Ready. Rush hour traffic. Really? I miss (laughs) it. Yes. I used to think this was the stupidest human thing on the planet. I'm like, how can everyone be okay with spending two hours of their lives every single day just in a car going back and forth? Like, you are wasting away. Um... And that it was very much my attitude. And, you know, it's still, I guess it still is my attitude. But um, there are little moments in everyday life that are routine. Um, and that routine gives you structure. And it gives you some kind of a weird comfort. And on top of that, something as simple as your commute to the office. This is a weird thing, but it's kind of like your me time where I notice now I don't get any me time because I wake up at five o'clock and I literally like bound out of bed and into my laptop and start writing immediately. Mm -hmm. And so there's like these little moments that are built into the United States lifestyle that we complain about and we, we absolutely hate. But sometimes I get the yearning for those things because it seems like, you know, they are a pain in the ass, but they're the quiet moments when you can kind of just be. You don't have to constantly be doing something productive. And, and you know, in my case with business, it's kind of a it's, it's it's a challenge when you're your own boss and you can do whatever you want. But when you're really excited about what you're doing, you end up doing a lot of work. Oh. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that because I'm I don't have a work visa down in the U.S., so it's kind of forced me to start my like entrepreneurial stuff that I've been talking about for years and years now. And there's times when I, I worked in retail before and I had hours all over the place and there's times where I'm just like, somebody tell me that I need to show up somewhere at 3 PM and do this because I'm having the hardest time motivating myself right now. Yes. Yeah, totally. And, and even better, somebody tell me when I can leave, like just tell me when I'm done and then I'm actually done and I don't have to feel guilty for not working later. And you don't have to feel like if that would be amazing. Um, even when I've tried to implement my own working hours, it's really just not a thing you can shut off, especially as a writer, because you're constantly creating ideas and brainstorming and thinking. So it becomes difficult and more so when it's your own business, because it's your ass on the line. If you're not doing the things you need to do, it's really not just like, Oh, well, whatever I put in my eight hours, live to see another day tomorrow. Um, that's just different. It's challenging. Mm Mm-hmm. In it saying is. that, is there any part of you that ever wants to go back to like a corporate lifestyle? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, sometimes I laugh and I, I think I've even published a blog post about this before because when I was younger, uh, throughout high school and college, I was, I worked at this ice cream stand for eight years. Wow. Oh yeah. I'm, I know everything there is to know about ice cream. <laughs> I worked at Dairy Queen for three years, so maybe we'll have to have like an ice cream off or something. <laughs> yes, 
Yes. And you probably have like similar pet peeves like I do. Like I remember my biggest pet peeve when people would just come to the window and be like, "Eh, just give me a vanilla or like a chocolate. Like what size do you want, man? It is to like specify some stuff. (laughs) <laughs> like, come on, this is not your first day. Like, you know, they're small, medium, and large, and you know, whatever size you pick is directly impacting the price. So don't tell me you don't care about it because you do. You just want me to ask you because that's how this interaction is supposed to go. And I <laughs> hated that. That's going to be a part of your system, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not even going to answer you. Just tell me. You tell me. <laughs> um, but yeah, sometimes I laugh because I'm like, you know, those were the days when. Of course, all I wanted to do was something more intellectually stimulating and meaningful and purposeful and exciting and have this big, awesome career I could really be proud of, which I still do advocate for. But there are the days when you're like, man, I remember when work was as simple as just making a milkshake. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a big trade off. I have a lot to be proud of now. I have a lot I'm really excited about. And I, I couldn't even imagined living this life the kind of like incredible things that have happened and that I'm I'm doing is so cool. But then it's also just a lot of responsibility and a lot of different obligations, things that are on your shoulders. It's never just as simple as making a milkshake anymore. Yeah. And it's kind of, you don't really ever get to turn off when it's your own thing too. Ever. So what (laughs) is that like? Obviously you live in this really cool place and you said that you guys travel a little bit how has your travels and your vacations changed since really like your business taking off? Oh, well now when I travel, I am obsessed with actually not opening my laptop. Um, yeah, I think for the reasons we're talking about, because I never do get that reprieve in my daily life. So now it's like a huge excuse. I'm like, wow, I'm going to Nicaragua. Awesome. I'm not going to, you know, my goal is not to open this laptop for three days. Um, which is different when I first approached it. When I used to travel and work in the beginning, I took so much pride in being able to open up my laptop anywhere at any cafe and just hang out. But I noticed as the months went on, no, I was there, but I wasn't ever really there. I, you know, I, I wasn't really looking at all of the details and really soaking it up. I was sitting there staring at the stupid screen. Mm-hmm. So I think I've gotten some different perspective now. Now when I travel, I really like to travel and just travel. Yeah. It seems like it's a cool transition from like, Ooh, I'm like working abroad and I'm hanging out at cool cafes and I'm doing all my work here to, okay, this is what I do and my business is successful. And now I need to like turn off and have some like restoration time for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it was the switch probably between going from freelancer where, you know, it's not a it's not a big organization. If you're a freelancer and you're doing some client work here and there, really the most you have to do is check in with your clients, make sure everything's cool, and and get your work done on the side. So I used to do that, and that was great in the beginning. But then as I started to grow a legit company with all of these different moving parts and customer service, and I mean, like you would be amazed at the issues that people have, and they email you, and then they tweet you about it, and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Things get a little, a, a bit more layered. <laughs> <laughs> Damn social media. <laughs> oh, you, yeah, it's fun. It's, I usually get like four different emails and four different mediums, like about one. Like I couldn't log in today. I'm like, hang on, like, <laughs> <laughs> or or reset your password. Like push that button and use it. It's there. Reset password. <laughs> So how do you manage your day um, and to to leave enough time to be creative and to write, but then to deal with all this kind of administrative stuff that comes up from being responsible for so much? Yeah. So remember when I said a minute ago that I leap out of bed and literally at 5 a.m. I just open my laptop and start writing? Yeah. Best time for me ever. That's when I do my real work. Um, when my eyes are barely open and I don't have time to think about all the other people and what they need and people aren't even awake yet. So they're not nagging me and I can really, it just feels like me time. It feels like this is my three hours to just focus on this book in this case. Um, and that has been my savior. I tried to write this book for years and tried to fit it in, you know, here and there. It wasn't until I finally got a routine 
and said, I'm going to wake up at five every day. I'm going to write for three hours and I don't give a shit what else is going on because this is my time. Life changing. That's awesome. And now that you're, I think I read that you're writing kind of like a memoir. Um, I am. Does it, it's a memoir does, meets business advice. Does it, is this kind of, does it really like feel like, well, I like, I've made it like to have this, um, good agent and have a book that you're writing? No, you know, sometimes it really feels like you think your friends are still saying the same things about you. Like nice blog or like, Oh, that's cute. You're writing a book. (laughs) (laughs) It still feels very much like, I mean, you're living it, but it, it, I don't know. I think until it actually happens and maybe afterward, will I be able to pat myself on the back? Because right now I'm so in the thick of the actual project that it's hard to step back and be like, wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always hard to savor something while it's going on. Yeah. And especially when you're having a hard writing day and you're like, oh my God, I'm such a failure. (laughs) (laughs) It's never going to to be published the world's gonna hate it <laughs> that uh, happens both of us do a lot of writing mm-hmm. so i feel like we can both relate to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. days where i'm like i am so creatively awesome and days where i'm like i freaking suck <laughs> so much yeah it happens to the best of us i literally have those days maybe once a week where i'm just like why like why why did i even write that paragraph that paragraph is stupid like what <laughs> <laughs> With there, one of the things we, um, we both really loved about Uni Guts and um, about the other blog posts is that you're really good at kind of empathizing with people and also just maintaining attention throughout um, a piece of writing, whether it's picking a, a cool word that kind of like sucks you back in or interesting thought or an interesting way of designing the actual font. What do you, um, what do you think was kind of key in developing that skill to be such a a good writer in terms of attention and empathy? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you, by the way. No, um, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes try to analyze myself to kind of deconstruct why? Because in the beginning of the Middle Finger Project, I, I really had no intentions of blowing it up like I have. I I remember the first blog post I wrote. I mean, I was really just screwing around, and I pushed publish, and I didn't really know that publish meant like live on the internet. I just, <laughs> it's just like out of my face. <laughs> means. I just thought like it would be. I don't know, like just just done like i didn't know it would be live like out there and uh i remember my first comment and all of a sudden i just i mean like i got an email notification that i had a comment i was like what like oh no it was my reaction like oh no <laughs> <laughs> like oh no i felt so naked like i just got caught with my pants down like ooh. and um it, it, it was this weird phenomenon because I kept writing and people kept reading it. <laughs> and I think because I started in the beginning without having any intentions on selling people and any intentions on getting them to opt in, I didn't have all of this stuff in the back of my head. I was really just being me and just talking like I am right now to you. I was saying really aggressive comments and making completely, you know, I don't know, completely inappropriate remarks. <laughs> and um, I, I don't know if it was the novelty of that because, you know, I, I published a post today that compared the internet and Google. It's just being like one giant Tinder and people are just like swiping left and swiping right to find a website, find somebody, you know, find somebody awesome. And with that being the case, I think that, interesting writing that's intelligent is so crucial to 
you getting noticed? And a lot of people ask me that too all the time. They're like, wow, well, like, what's the deal? I think if I had to guess that I've had a lot of success because I'm able to, to talk very conversationally, mm-hmm. which is cool. But at the same time, I'm not just writing fluff. Um, I really do make a, a very concerted effort to, to say something smart, to say something that I really believe and know to be true. That's going to be helpful. And I think that's been the difference between somebody who's just like, so guys, like, here's what I did today. And I don't know. What do you think about this? And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so each piece is looked at as it's, it's very own standalone product in a way. And I put a lot of work into it hours for each blog post. That's amazing. I know reading You Need Guts, I felt like it was like you knew me really well and like you were my best friend sitting me down and being like, yo, Amanda, like this is what's up. Like this is what you need to do. Like just giving it to me straight. Like every time I opened it up to read it, that's how I felt. I was like, how does she know me? (laughs) She doesn't know me, but she does. You know what's crazy about that is that is the number one comment I get from people. I feel like you get me or I feel like you were in my head. And that has been mind blowing for me because I, you know, I don't even know how I do that. (laughs) Really? I don't know. That's the, that's the consensus, which is awesome. It's such a huge honor. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing to read something and feel like somebody knows you so well and they're talking directly to you. Like, I feel like that's, that makes an incredible piece of work. Thank you. I think I've always tried to put myself back in my old shoes whenever I, I don't know, I think about the past a lot and I think about my journey and I think about different things that I've learned and I always try to use that in some meaningful way. But I'm, I think I'm really good at describing exactly how I felt in that moment and maybe that produces that effect. Yeah, yeah I think so. Probably being real and authentic with people. Can you believe it? We're all actually human after all. Yeah. <laughs> Except, except fairly the, certain that most of us are. Except the aliens out there. Yeah. <laughs> except for those guys. Those are the guys who are showing up, slapping me across the face of the wet fish. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, we want to be respectful of your time, but it's been it's been awesome getting a chance to talk with you, Ash. Ryan, Amanda, thank you so much. I can't wait till the podcast comes out. I think you guys are awesome. I really hope we cross paths at some point. In some country. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, we Central America is definitely in our in our sights for the future. So Oh, well come on down. I'll point out all the hippies. <laughs> <laughs> we can go yell at hippies and avoid fish together. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much again. If there's um anywhere that people can like check out your stuff, obviously we'll put the middle finger project up on the show notes. Is there anywhere else that people can check you out? I think the middle finger project is the best for writing, but I really love Twitter. I'm on Twitter quite a bit, just shooting the shit. So at TMF project, um, is me and I'm there all the time. I'm a fancy little iPhone. (laughs) Sounds great. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you as well. You guys take care and I will talk to you soon. I'm sure of it. Okay. Bye guys. So I hope everybody enjoyed listening to the interview as much as we enjoyed participating in it. Yeah, definitely. It was a super fun interview to be a part of. Yeah, so. very fun conversation. Yeah. And if any of you guys are considering going to South America, which you probably should be. Obviously. Why Amanda you be, and really? I have assembled a guide. Yes, with travel tips, travel hacks, things that we've learned that Lonely Planet is most likely not going to tell you. Yeah, it's called the No Bullshit Guide to South America. Yeah. And you can find it on our website by subscribing to our newsletter. And then receiving an email with this fantastic guide. So definitely go check that out. Or don't. I don't care. (laughs) (laughs) I think you probably should, though. But yeah, check it out. Um, and join our community on Facebook at the world wonders and on Twitter, it's world wonders one on Twitter. So definitely reach out to us, send us a message. If you've got any questions, comments, thoughts, feelings, we're happy to hear from you. And we're working on a project right now where we assemble listener stories into a mega episode where the best travel stories ever. Yeah. With six to 10 listeners, 
with their best travel stories told in five to 10 minutes. So if you have a fantastic travel story um, that you'd be interested in telling, shoot us an email info at the world Yes. Nailed it. As always, thanks for listening. Peace.